If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people who work in graveyard shifts, at haunted places, gas stations, isolated locations, etc. What's your most scary paranormal experience? I worked as a PSW on the night shift at a long-term care home. I had a resident bell ring at 2.59 am I went in and asked her what she needed, and she proceeded to yell that there was a man in her bathroom and I needed to get him out. We had people who would wander into other rooms, so I asked her what the man looked like, and she said that he was a black figure and he had no face. I calmed her down and then told whoever was in the bathroom that they had to leave her alone. I then went back to my charting. Around 3.10, I had another call bell ring, but from the other side of the floor, from where the first bell went off, I went into this resident's room, this particular resident would ask for pain meds around this time, and I asked if he needed meds. He told me, and I quote, there's a creepy man in my room with no face, you need to get him out. My blood ran cold, and I had a nurse stay with me on the floor for the rest of my shift. I worked overnight at a large corporate office, and one night while doing rounds, checking doors, stairways, and boiler rooms, there was a long hallway, maybe 400 feet long, with offices on both sides and a large window at the end. I'm walking down, looking into the offices, and in the window on the door, I see what looks to be someone standing behind me. I brush as my reflection and continue on. While walking down the hallway, I look at my reflection in the large window and continue to see something that looks like I have a second head. I start to do my rounds a little faster, getting more creeped out, then my partner in the camera room talks over the radio, asking me if an office employee is walking with me. I noped out of there and asked for a transfer the next day. I worked day shift security at a museum slash historic village in Michigan. The houses had been moved across the country from various places and put all in one place. Many of them were hundreds of years old. There were houses where you would walk in and hear footsteps walking around upstairs. This is when we were closed and the buildings were locked up. Also, there were houses that I would walk into and feel like I was not welcome here and needed to leave immediately. On the flip side, there were houses that I could walk into when having a crappy day, and I would always be in a better mood when I left. I would talk to the night shift guards, and they would tell you about the lights and voices they would experience in the museum at night. We have the chair that Lincoln was sitting in when he was shot and the car that Kennedy was riding in when he was shot. They swore up and down that you would hear and see things around both of them at night. I worked in a surgery center after hours with one other employee. Tons of weird stuff has happened, but the most frightening was. We were in the post-op area, shutting things down for the night. My coworker comes to find me a few rooms down and asks if I just walked by the room she was in. I said, no. I've been in here for a few minutes. Why? She then says she saw someone out of the corner of her I walked by while humming and wearing scrubs, the same color I was wearing. A few minutes later, we were together and started to walk out of the post-op area after everything was shut down and the lights were all off. We hear a strange noise, turn around, and see the main row of hallway lights turn on, they require a switch not motion sensing. We kind of freak out, and she yells out, okay. Who is in here trying to scare us? We then proceed to walk towards that hallway and check all the rooms in it. Nothing. So we proceed into the product receiving area and notice that the room slash hall had its lights on too, those are motion activated, and we hadn't been in there all night, those lights turn off after 5 minutes of no motion. She goes left, and I go right towards the exit door that leads to the parking lot. In the door's window, I see the reflection of my coworker and also a reflection of a woman who is standing and facing the wall right next to my coworker, literally two feet away from her. I freak the hell out and go sprinting back into the post-op area. She follows me, screaming and asking what the hell is going on. I told her what I saw, and we got the hell out of there. I've also had a bathroom door slam shut all by itself in that post-op area and the emergency call button be engaged, nobody in it. I was a security guard at a scrap yard and one day I went into the small management building to do my business. We had a small bridge with a scale, and cars would drive in and get weighed, then drive out and get weighed again to see how much scrap was removed. Of note, this was during the Slenderman craze, and someone had drawn his symbol all over the place, most likely bored kids with their parents looking through the scrap when no one was looking or people that came onto the site when there was no one there. Yes, even though I worked security, I'd get there after the crew had left for the day and leave before they arrived. I was a security guard at a scrap yard, and one day I went into the site building to do my business. We had a small bridge with a scale, and cars would drive in and get weighed, then drive out and get weighed again to see how much scrap was removed. Anyway, after I'd cleaned up, I noticed the scale was going from 0 to 200 pounds. I looked out the window, this yard was in a wooded area, and the trees weren't moving an inch, 
so it wasn't the wind. Then I heard a roaring sound. Even though this was a wooded area, we were still developed enough for there to be no animals that could make that sound. I spent the rest of the shift in my car. The fence gate opened, and I was prepared to nope out of there if needed. This happened a few weeks ago. My mother had left earlier in the day for work and was working a night shift. I did not know what shift she was working at the time. I'm sitting on the couch scrolling when I hear my mother's voice calling boyo boyo, that's what she calls me sometimes, so I get up and open the front door to let her in. I open the door, and no one is there. I look around outside, and no one is in the yard. I leave the door open and go ask my stepfather if he heard anyone calling, he said he didn't and that I must be hearing things. I say okay and go and close the door. The rest of the day was uneventful, but two nights later I woke up, and I'm a very, very light sleeper. I passed my hand over my shoulder, and there's blood dripping from it, along with some somewhat deep scratches like nails being dragged across it. I used to work overnights alone in a group home to pay for college. Just me, 5 feet 3 inches female college student, and 12 kids between ages 12 and 18, there was one other staff member from day shift usually physically present for ratios, but they were asleep and locked in an upstairs bedroom. It was pretty quiet work most of the time, and I could get homework done during the wee hours, which was pretty handy. The house was donated to the agency because the family who had lived there didn't want it anymore, for some reason my boss wouldn't go into it. Part of my overnight routine was to go down to the basement and finish up any laundry the boys hadn't finished during the day. Frankly, just being involved with the laundry of 12 adolescent boys was scary enough to warrant a story here. Anyway, there was a walk-in supply cupboard down there where we kept detergent, etc., so sometimes I'd have to go in and pick up some soap, etc. The storage area had its own light, but the basement as a whole just had a single bulb hanging over the washers. So coming out of the comparatively bright storage into the dark basement was always a little creepy. Multiple times I saw what I can only say looked and felt like someone in white rushing past out of the corner of my eye while bending into the washers and fishing out clothes. It was particularly in one corner of the basement and had a very negative energy to it. Each time, I would flip out and book it upstairs, locking the basement behind me. I felt stupid about this, but I really couldn't stop myself. Later, when I finally explained it to my boss, when I told him why I really wanted to stay out of the basement, he confirmed that the family had donated the house because their father had hanged himself from a beam in that exact corner. I used to clean a church alone late at night. There was a piano upstairs, which I thought was broken, which was why it was upstairs in the attic. One night, I started hearing piano music from the attic. I immediately assumed someone was up there pranking me, so I went up, and there was no one. When I turned around to walk away after realizing no one was there, I heard a loud bang behind this metal door, which I assume was an attic closet. I never worked the night shift again. Asked by the one other person who worked night shifts, she confirmed the weird shit happening was normal. I worked in a county jail, and it was definitely haunted. A pregnant woman I worked with saw a, very angry, ghost wearing a three-piece suit standing in the administration office. Guards would report hearing footsteps out in the wings and radio to central control, they have cameras, to ask who else was in the unit. Central would report back that no one else was walking around. I also went to our very decrepit old facility to look for records. Also definitely creepy, but we didn't see or experience anything. A guard I worked with who had been a jail employee for 30 plus years had a picture of a little girl apparition in the old jail. Other old timers had seen the same little girl. I was working late at night at Colonial Williamsburg. It was my job to turn off the lights at the governor's mansion and a few other places at the end of the night. I got done and was walking to my car when my boss called me and said that I had missed a light. I was pretty new, so I just said yes, sir, and headed back. Sure enough, a light way up in the attic was visible from outside. So I went in, went to the top floor, and climbed up there on the little ladder. Once up there, there were no lights on. I didn't think too much of it at this point, so I went all the way down and back outside. Once outside again, I started back to my car. My boss sent me a text and asked if I was going to take care of it or not. I told him I did, and he was upset because he thought I was lying. I headed back to the mansion, and sure enough, the light was on. I headed all the way back up there, and the light was off again. I was literally staring out the window that was lit from the outside. At this point, I figured someone was screwing with me, so I headed back out in a huff. I got downstairs, and my boss met me at the door, upset. Are you going to turn that dang light out or what? It was out, are you screwing with me? So we both headed up there, and the light was off. But. There was the distinct odor of a candle and what appeared to be a haze of smoke around the window. The first and only time I saw a ghost, 
a dead person, a demon, or whatever you want to call it, was exactly a year ago today. I had just gotten my bachelor's after three years of studying social welfare, and I was now working at a group home for teens with substance use problems. My workplace was in a big old house, which was almost scary quiet during the night, and I often felt anxious being there. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed the job and spending time with the teens, but working at night scared the shit out of me. I usually start my shift around 18 p.m. around that time, we often made dinner, I helped out with homework, and we talked for hours dealing with all sorts of issues until I went to bed, usually around 1 a.m. and this was one of those days. I fell asleep at 1.30 a.m. and woke up two hours later, like I usually do to get a glass of water. I walked down the stairs, entered the common room, and then walked by a big window in the living room. I looked up at the gray, cloudy sky when I saw death hanging from a tree. Brown, rotten flesh in the shape of a face. I rubbed my eyes and then looked again, and the flesh was still there. I couldn't move, breathe, or blink my eyes for a few seconds. I was absolutely terrified. After a while, I found the strength to move my legs and walked into the office again. I locked the door and sat there all night, and when the sun finally peeked out, I managed to move my legs to go and look out of the window again. No rotten flesh this time, just a normal tree with green leaves. A few days after this incident, I told my boss I didn't want to work night shifts anymore because of the lack of sleep. I didn't want to tell her the real reason, since she would probably think I was mad. Maybe I was. And what if this was just a nightmare? Probably, but what if it wasn't? Can anyone relate? Have you seen something like this before? Well, it's not really early in the morning. One night, my girlfriend at the time woke me up in the middle of the night because I liked some girl's pictures, someone I knew on the high school business page, I always try to support friends' businesses by liking our sharing page. She continued to argue with me all night, knowing I had worked early in the morning. At the time, I was driving for city transit. So it's finally time for work, and I got maybe two hours of sleep at most. I get there, and I'm super tired. I probably should have called off, but I needed the hours. So I blasted down some energy drinks and started my day. There are two sides of the route, the side I started on only took like 30 minutes to get to downtown, so I get into downtown and I'm picking up people, then I realize I'm at the other end of the line, and some guy is getting off my bus, saying thank you for getting him where he needed to go very fast, and I did an excellent job at driving. Mind you, I don't remember picking up this guy at all, and from downtown to the other side's end of the line, it was a two-hour ride. I had two hours of unaccounted time go by. I was so scared because I couldn't remember any of it, for all I know, anything could have happened. I got to the end of the line, called the dispatcher, and let them know I was feeling really sick and needed a relive. About 45 minutes later, someone relived me, and I went home with my heart still racing. I never experienced sleep deprivation again. A scary lesson was learned, and thankfully, I didn't hurt anyone or hit anything. I'm a night shift worker, one of only two, in a care home. It's a very eerie place, to say the least, as it was built in the 1800s as servant quarters for a very wealthy family with a nearby estate. There are two floors and a basement with an underground tunnel, which adds to the scariness of the place. We often hear all sorts of noises late at night, after all the residents are in bed and sound asleep. Sometimes it's walking, which could easily be chalked away by a client roaming around their room. Often, there is the sound of a door chain sliding and someone walking towards us. Other times there is running which is very odd as none of our clients have the physical capacity to run. Many are unable to even walk, and the ones that can walk do so unsteadily or very slowly. Doors sometimes stick. Lights are cut on and off, along with faucets and taps. Sometimes items have moved or plugs have been pulled from walls. On one instance, the fire escape alarm went off, signaling that a fire escape door had been opened, none of which could be opened from the outside. We always do rounds, hourly rounds, and make an extra round when we hear a noise to check on clients. More often than not, they are sleeping, and nothing is found. The clients all have dementia, so you can't necessarily trust what they say, as most can't communicate well or coherently and others see things or hallucinate. However, some of the residents have, in passing, said things like who was that that walked by? Or I just saw a head over there, or what is that boy doing in the corner? Again, this can be explained away, such as their dementia fueling hallucinations. So in my very skeptical mind, I always let the creepy feelings pass and rationalize them away each time. This past week, however, something shook me, and I can't rationalize it away. It was time for another round, and I had stayed back for my coworker to grab sheets from the laundry room. As I walked through the dining room, I saw legs walking in the kitchen, a locked zone due to safety hazards for the residents. 
These legs looked more like the silhouette of legs filled in with black ink. Our uniform consists of black work trousers, so it was easy to assume it was the bottom half of my coworker I was looking at. In fact, I was so certain it was my coworker in there that I stayed outside the kitchen, waiting for her for rounds, only to hear her walking around upstairs. One of my seniors has also claimed to only see the legs walking from one resident's room to another on a different floor. And my hair stood on end when she told me this. The odd stuff begins to happen around 2 a.m. up until 4 a.m., sometimes later. Is there a specific reason for the hours the incidences seem to take place? A story was told to me by my prison guard escort. I used to work the night shift when I first started here in prison. I always signed up for but never got the rover job. Rover is a guard that sits in the guard shack and makes rounds twice a shift to check every door and every gate to ensure they are locked, and he also checks the perimeter fences to make sure they have not been tampered with. One night, I finally got what I thought was going to be the easiest shift I had ever had, I landed the rover job. During that shift, my first trip around the perimeter and gates went just fine, everything was as it should be. However, my second round was a little different. I was patrolling the tunnel access points, checking the gates and doors as I had done earlier that day. In the tunnel, there are three books that the rover must sign to prove they made their appointed rounds. I had books A and B signed, I just had book C to go. Book C lay down a long and dark corridor. Picture a long hallway with one bare bulb lighting up a patch of the path every 20 or 30 feet. I entered the hallway and closed and locked the gate behind me. As I started to walk towards the book end of the hall, I heard footsteps behind me. I hurried to the first patch of light and looked behind me, no one was there. When I stopped, so did the accompanying footsteps, so I wrote it off as an echo. I continued on, and as soon as I exited the patch of light, the footsteps returned, this time just a little faster. It was almost like it was trying to catch up. Once again, in the next patch of light, I stopped and looked for my pursuer. And again I saw nothing, and the steps stopped. I turned and looked towards book C. It's two more patches of light away, it was actually in a third patch by itself, like a beacon of safety. I'm starting to get a little nervous about now, so I pull out my flashlight and shine it around. My light illuminates nothing but the damp walls of this part of the tunnel, so I keep on walking. As soon as I left that patch of light, I heard those steps again, only this time it sounded like they were jogging towards me. I quickly spun around and shined my light towards the sound, and once again I saw nothing. I decided now was not the time to mess around, so I ran to the last light in the book so I could get the hell out of this tunnel. As I reached the book, I could hear the steps sprinting towards me. I quickly signed my name in the book, and as I wrote down the time, I heard a heavy sigh behind me. And right in my ear, a husky voice whispered my name. I slowly turned my head toward the sigh. Seeing nothing, I sprinted out of there, stopping only long enough to lock the doors behind me. I still get goosebumps thinking about it, and I can still feel the breath in my ear from when it whispered my name. I put in for a shift change right away, and I never signed up for over duty again. Years ago, I worked as an orderly in a small hospital on the night shift. Most of the work was just answering call lights and cleaning up messes. We had one room where the call light would go off seemingly on its own, patients in the room would deny pushing it, or it would go off when the room was empty. The story the older nurses told was of an elderly lady who spent a lot of time in that room before she passed, and it was her asking for help. We all laughed about it, and it was a long-running joke, and whenever anything peculiar happened in that room, it was just attributed to Vicky looking for attention. 35 years have passed since that time, and after a career, I find myself working in the same hospital as a retirement job. Vicky's room has since been converted into a surgical area, bright, shiny, and new, but whenever I pass that area and all of the lights are off, I swear, out of the corner of my eye, I can see someone standing in the PACU. I know it's an optical illusion, but it still gives me shivers. I recently told this story to a friend who has worked here all this time, and now whenever I see her, she swats me for telling her the story because she has started seeing Vicky out of the corner of her eye too. When I was younger, I had an agency job cleaning buses at the local depot. The pay was crap, but it was a chill job where you were left to your own devices most of the time. The fleet was mostly modern, but there were a few ancient double-deckers kept around for less grueling duties. One of those buses, in particular, was haunted. The other cleaner and I would often hear people walking around the top deck when cleaning the bottom deck, and when you were up on the top deck, you'd sometimes hear footsteps slowly coming up the stairwell. They would always stop once they hit the top step. Some nights you'd hear the distinctive creaking sound of the destination blind being cranked from the driver's cabin too, but when you ran down, the blind or its handle hadn't moved an inch. One night, 
I was on my knees, sweeping up broken glass with a dustpan and brush, when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Behind the seat I was sweeping in front of, I could see a pair of legs. They were as solid as any other pair of legs, and I remember what they were wearing very clearly, green corduroy trousers, dark socks, and brown brogues. Then they began to bend. I was shitting myself and fell back with my eyes firmly closed. When I dared myself to reopen them, there was nothing there. I finished as quickly as possible and moved on to the next bus. Over a cup of tea, I told the other cleaner I'd seen something weird on that bus, and she just looked at me and went, are they green legs? I never saw those legs again, but apparently she saw them a few times. Always just the legs. She never dared to look up and just looked elsewhere until they disappeared. It has already been three weeks since I started working the night shift in the office. I worked for a small private company where we encoded documents. We work on the third floor of this small building, and the only entrance to my office is to take the back door of the building to get to the stairs to the entrance of my office. The first floor is a small local bank, while the second floor is abandoned and is currently being remodeled to put in more computers that we can use. Well, in the office, we had a lot of unspoken rules, but the one that really got my attention was the rule, never ever go to the second floor alone. This is because apparently there have been some rumors that our second floor is haunted and will regularly make its presence known to those that go there during the night shift. Our boss even had it blessed four times already, ever since we got the building, but the haunting still continued. So one time, when the bathrooms on our floor were either occupied or the pipes were being fixed, two of my female co-workers, Jan and Anne, decided to go to the second floor bathroom. They asked me and another male co-worker, Rymark, to come with them to the second floor for extra protection. Me and the other co-worker didn't mind because we were looking for an excuse to go out and have a smoke break. Once we got to the second floor, all the lights were turned off, and we opened the first office room because it was where the bathroom was decent and big enough for two people. The girls went to the bathroom while me and the other male co-worker were in the pantry of the room, just outside the bathroom, smoking. After about five minutes, me and the other co-worker heard movement from the room, and we even joked around that the hunting had started, but we ultimately convinced ourselves that it was just rats. When the girls finished doing their business, we went out, but as we were going to the door, we heard the bathroom toilet flush and the lights in the bathroom turned on. My other Rymark and Anne decided to go back and turn the light off. But the moment they turned the corner, I felt really cold, and a chill ran down my spine as I began to hear movement from the room I was in. I felt someone hold onto my hand, and when I looked, it was Jen holding onto my hand and looking scared. Then we both saw one of the chairs move, as if someone had moved it to sit down. I quickly covered Jen's mouth before she could scream. We just stood there and looked at the empty chair, and I felt as if someone was actually looking at me, as if I could picture in my mind that someone was smiling. It felt like an eternity until we heard a scream from the bathroom, and I saw Rymark and Anne running towards me as they pulled me and Jen out of the room, and all four of us ran back to the third floor. They were both pale white and shaking, they told us that when they were going to turn off the lights in the bathroom, when they got inside, they both saw the faucet on the sink turning, water began to run down and the toilet flushed again, then the light turned off on its own. They both stood in fear until they both swear on their lives that they heard someone whisper something to them, and that was when they screamed and ran. They were not able to make out what was said in the whisper, and when we entered the office, we were all visibly shaken, and our shift manager just looked at us and said, second floor. Let me guess, first room? I was shocked because how did she know we went to the first room, and why was she so casual? We mumbled for a response, and she just replied, he doesn't like it when a lot of people go to his room, next time go to the third room, it's much more friendly because kids are in there, just don't go to the second room. I have no idea how she can be this casual about what is happening, but, safe to say, I never went to the second floor ever again. I had been working at this burrito place for a few years. It was in this big, almost abandoned shopping center in the middle of the city. It used to be full of thriving businesses, but since 2007, They've all gone out of business except for the burrito place and ice cream parlor that were right next to each other on a Tuesday morning. A lot of homeless people sleep there, but other than that, it's usually quiet. There were two entities in the burrito shop, one a mimic and the other a poltergeist, but they weren't scary and never showed themselves. My co-workers and I were used to them, and for the most part, it was okay, but people looked at me sideways when this happened. It was after hours. I was working the night shift, like usual, and I was taking out the trash. When I pushed the cart outside and came around to the back alley, I saw something I couldn't explain. It was crouched down on all fours, about five feet across, by the door of the compactor slash dumpster. It had grayish tan skin, was thin, with its spine protruding, and had a small, almond-shaped head. 
It had four limbs, as far as I could tell, but they were bent like spider legs. I didn't get a good enough look at its feet. It either had two long slits for eyes or they were closed. I didn't see a mouth or a nose. I immediately pushed the cart and ran back inside. I stood there a minute and thought that maybe my eyes were playing tricks or I'm just getting freaked out for no reason. After calming myself down, I went back out there. The trash cart was still there, and when I came around the corner, it was still there, motionless. I was so scared and confused that I ran again and told my manager what I saw and what I needed her to see. Of course, it was gone, and she thought I was making it up. What's weird to me is that it was just sitting there. It wasn't moving or making any sounds. I tried looking up what this could be, but I've found nothing. Any ideas? One of my mom's best friends, we'll call her Anne for this story, used to be a nurse at a long-term care home. She now works in hospice, so she's quite familiar with death. A few months ago, she told me a story that I couldn't shake, so I thought I'd share it here. When Anne was working as the assistant Don in our local nursing home, she was on the night shift with a new aide. They had a resident who had been sick for some time, and they knew she would likely pass that night. This woman was very sweet and kind, however, she said her whole life she had struggled with her faith, always feeling as if the devil or demons were after her and wanted her. She would study her Bible often but said she still struggled. And would do her best to comfort her, but this poor woman was still uneasy and fearful. This aide had never seen anyone die before, so she asked Anne if she could be there to care for this woman as she passed. Anne said, absolutely, and when she thought this woman was about to pass, she brought the aide in. At first, it seemed like any other death, her breaths became drawn out and further apart, and everything seemed calm. It looked like this woman would have a peaceful death, like she was drifting off to sleep. Suddenly, her eyes shot open, and she began to shout, they're after me. They're after me. Anne and the aide kept trying to calm her, asking, who is after you? And the woman just repeated the same thing. They're after me. They're coming for me. Then, as abruptly as she started, she stopped. Her breaths became more labored, and finally they stopped altogether. The aide was quite shaken up, so Anne told her to take some time to collect herself. The aide left, and Anne alerted the other nurses to what happened to get arrangements in order. Once the aide felt comfortable returning, they went back to the room to begin cleaning the body. The room was terribly cold and heavy when they went back in, according to Anne, it just felt off. As they started to clean the body, a thick, black goo began to run out of the woman's nose, mouth, and eyes. She said it wasn't like typical post-mortem fluid she'd encountered before, which was usually a blood mixture. It was thick, like crude oil, and just kept coming and coming. Anne is a seasoned nurse, but after hearing what the woman said and the heaviness in the room, she wanted to do her job as quickly as she could and get out. They finished up with the woman, and eventually the mortuary people came and picked her up. Anne apologized to the aide and said she was sorry that this experience was her first with death. They both said a prayer for the woman and went about the rest of their shift. Anne has had many brushes with the paranormal in her line of work, but this is the one she finds the most disturbing. She believes that this woman was fighting her demons to the very end and isn't sure if she won the battle. And still prays for this woman's soul and hopes she has found peace. I work nights at a nursing home, and I witness weird things that I try to explain logically or chalk up as sleep deprivation. We have a thick binder for shift reports, and I wrote something down regarding a patient. After five minutes, I came back to write another report, and the binder was closed. We don't have any residents with the mental or physical capacity to play pranks on me. Two days after a resident passed away, the call light in her empty room started going off at 3 a.m. She used to press it every five minutes, driving us nuts when she was alive. I had to chant, this isn't happening, this isn't happening, as I went into the room to turn it off. I used to talk to this one resident almost all night during my shift. She predicted her own death pretty well. She'd constantly tell me, in her deep, smoker's voice, if I die, I don't have to worry about my dog, with you liking her so much. A week later, she went in for a minor surgery and died. A day later, during my shift, around 3.45 a.m., I heard a deep voice distinctly say hey. Which is how she usually greets me. Every single hair on my body stood up. I froze for about 10 minutes. Her dog is still with us, don't worry. I take her grooming once a month. Two weeks ago, at 3.25 a.m., I left the facility to get something from my car. The parking lot is 10 feet away from the building. I unlocked my car with my remote, left it on the table by the exit of the facility, and went to my car. As soon as I reached the car door handle, someone locked it, with the hazards flashing. I've never had issues with my remote malfunctioning or anything before. The timing of the lock makes no sense to me. 
It was as if whatever pressed the lock button waited for me to reach for the handle. I ran as fast as I could inside, and the key is untouched. Exactly where I left it. Again, these incidents aren't really dramatic. But I'm as practical as they get. I'm not religious or superstitious at all. I believe everything has a scientific explanation. Or rather, I was. I don't know what to believe. Perhaps after a life ends, you can whiff out traces of it here and there. Sort of like the lingering smell of smoke after blowing out a candle. The energy lingers for a bit. I was a CNA working the third shift at an end-of-life senior care facility in Upper Michigan near Lake Huron. The hours were usually quiet as everybody was in bed or heading there, and meals were over. The overnight job entailed lots of cleaning, mopping, dusting, and preparing for breakfast at 8 a.m., as well as answering night calls or being on death watch every 15 minutes. Those were the worst, as you knew death was soon. One resident was close but could linger for days, the doctor said. People said and did the oddest things at those last gasps, too. Needless to say, it was not an easy job, but the pay sucked equally as well. Small town blues for job prospects. Watching other people's family members die is not for the faint of heart. It's a constant reminder of life's worst parts and the limited time we have been given. One of my favorite co-workers with a great upbeat attitude, Val, and I shared this night shift together. We knew our preferred tasks and set about happily chatting with each other in the dining room getting it ready for breakfast. Val needed to use the nearby employee toilet for an extended stay, so I proceeded to mop the opposite hallway facing the nurse's station and bathroom where Val was. I mop backwards, pulling rather than pushing, so I don't leave footprints, so naturally I don't see where the carpet begins, and I need to dip my mop to turn my direction until my shoe heel hits the edge. I can mindlessly do this while looking around the hallway. I was in the process of dipping and squishing my mop when a form caught my eye in the hallway arch entrance to the doors leading to both the nurse's station and the bathroom where Val was. I thought it was her return to the floor, refreshed and unburdened from previous meals. Nope. What I saw gave me a great open-mouthed, silent scream pause. Peeking and stretching out across a part of the hallway ceiling, maybe 15 feet long, into the main, taller hallway where I stood frozen, was a dark human shadow, all smoky and eyeless. It stayed there for maybe two to four seconds, then, zip, it shot back into the hallway. I stood there, scared, silent, and immobile, as I heard the bathroom door open. Val screamed, then slammed the door again. I heard her call my name through the closed door and slowly crept to the hallway to see nothing there but the doors to the nurse's station, the bathroom, and now the break room across from the utility closet where the cleaning supplies lived. The hallway was clear. I called Val's name from outside the door, knocking too. She asked, squeaking, is it gone? I responded quietly, yes. What did you see? Because I saw something. Get out here now. Don't leave me alone with that. Val came out and grabbed me in a hug so hard that I knew she was scared. Val shook, saying that she opened the bathroom door, which should have seen the nurse's station open door and part of the hallway wall. What she saw blocked the door and most of the wall. It was huge, filled the wall, and was smoke black. She didn't see a top or face shape to it, but it blocked her exit like a smoky haze right against the door leaking in. So she slammed the door fast and screamed my name. We worked side by side for the rest of our shift, never leaving each other's sight until it was time to leave. The morning shift supervisor wondered why we both clocked out and bolted in a huge hurry that day. Val told her about it later in a text message, saying she was taking a day off. Not sure if it was a reaper we saw, but right after we clocked out, a resident died five minutes later. I work security, and I picked up an overnight shift at a different post than my usual post for some OT. I can't get too specific about where I work. So the other night, I was working on this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks up to check on any and all personnel that did try to enter the facility. Both roads that lead to my gate were blocked off, one less than half a mile just north of me and another a little over two miles to my south, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights will just be visible down by me on my cameras. I was sitting there, drinking some coffee, to try and keep myself awake. I had hardly seen anybody, my sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on camera, and as the truck was pulling up and coming to a stop, I saw a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck. When I opened up my eyes a little wider to focus, I saw a ducking move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe somebody was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. 
As I'm looking out, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there a ducking is on screen. The silhouette of a man who looks to be wearing a hazmat suit. I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera, and as I'm doing this in real time, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio to the other two guards, asking if they had let any personnel get through their checkpoints, and get a negative response back, asking me what's up. I told them to stand by as I went to review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watched stunned as the truck came pulling to the north guard shack, its lights shining on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouetted figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. She looks towards the truck, does a double take from me to the truck, and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going ducking crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift changed to show the other guards I worked with overnight and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything back that night or anything to the guards coming on shift, and I played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped, and they saw exactly what I did without me pointing out anything. This is a regular occurrence where you work. Most of the guards that have been here a while have seen things and have stories. I just finally got what I've been waiting for, solid proof for myself. I work at a psychiatric hospital that was built on an old Civil War battlefield, which was a large plantation before that. The hospital itself was built in the 1970s, but the administrative building was the plantation's old manor house. Back when I had my interview, I remember thinking how creepy the graveyard by the entrance was. I ignored it for the most part, as I've lived in the area for 20 plus years now and even went to elementary school across the road on the other side of the battlefield. The history of the area is nothing new to me. Because nights are boring and I'm a huge adrenaline junkie, I like hearing the stories about paranormal things that have been witnessed around here. I've been told that staff has seen people dressed in Civil War uniforms walking the grounds and African Americans in long skirts and button-ups sitting on the stairs of the manor house. Apparently, the ghost of the old manor boy plays in the fields behind the hospital. Visitors have even asked if we have a Civil War play going on in the small school that residents attend while they're here. Reports of bizarre things have come from multiple people. So the unit that I specifically work on has 10 boys ages 9 to 12. I'm by myself at night since our staff resident ratio is 110 while they're asleep, and, while I have a walkie-talkie and there are sensors that go off whenever a resident gets out of bed, it still is pretty creepy. I'll hear clear knocking on the bedposts, three knocks indicate a resident has to use the bathroom, get water, or need staff for something, but when I ask who's knocking and check the rooms, all of the residents will be fast asleep. I told other staff this, and they insisted that the kids were just messing with me since I was new. It seems logical, so I just got used to it. I also noticed creaking and odd sounds in the day room, where the TV and door to the small laundry room are, but it's an old building, right? Wrong. Apparently, my unit is haunted as hell. About a week ago, a fellow staff member that I had never met stopped by to cover for me while I ran to the bathroom. When I came back, she was just staring at me. It was long enough to cause me to ask what was up with her. She just said, you know this unit is haunted? Which is exactly what I want to hear at 4 a.m. oh yeah. I asked sarcastically. She told me that the spirit of a girl lives in the day room. She wears a white gown and has long, dark hair. I thought she was ducking with me, so I joked that I'd pick up a round sheet for her and that hopefully she'd come keep me company because I was bored as hell. The staff looked me dead in the eyes and said, girl, I'm serious. I asked her if she was saying that because she knows that the door to the laundry room in the day room opens by itself sometimes and was trying to scare me. What? She says, yeah, sometimes it'll just pop open. I think the frame is warped. I responded. Honey, that door is locked. It can't open by itself. It is safe to say I was even more creeped out then. I still figured she was ducking with me because I'm pretty new, but of course, the other day, another staff member told me that my unit was haunted before she knew I had even worked on that one in particular. She said the ghost of a woman named Rosa lives here and acts as a guardian for the children. Apparently, multiple kids over the years have seen her and described her in the same way. She says they've seen her crouching in the corner, as if that isn't the ducking scariest mental image she could have given me. She told me she's a spirit and isn't harmful, she's just a protector. But of course, since then, I've been writhing in anxiety sitting here on nights alone, kind of. Anyway, about 30 minutes ago, I went into the day room and checked to make sure there was no laundry left to be done. I closed the laundry room door, then moved a spinning chair to face the other way since it was creeping me out facing me. The chair spun back to where it was before, but I figured it was probably old and just stuck in that spot. Whatever. I sat back down in my chair and was hanging out when the laundry room door slowly creaked open. 
Like that loud, eerie, horror movie creaking. I look over, and it's wide open. I got the worst chills of my life and am now preparing for my imminent death. I got to love the night shift. To be honest, I believe in ghosts and the paranormal, but I didn't really believe the nursing home I work in would be haunted. Weird, I know. I always thought to myself, why would any soul choose to be in a nursing home any longer than it would have to be? The unit I am currently on seems to have the most activity, based on my own personal experience. I've worked on all of the units, but on this one I've seen the most. Almost every single day, I see shadow people. I catch glimpses out of the corner of my eye, or I just see a shadowy figure straight on. I work evening and night shifts. Strangely, I've experienced more on the evening shift. The unit I work on is also the COVID unit, so that might be partly why it's more active. The COVID wing consists of two very long halls that meet together at a double door that leads to a kitchen area where there is also another residential room. It's kind of a weird setup, but hey, it works. My coworker was behind the double doors one night taking care of one of the sick residents, and she had gone out to the kitchen area to take off her PPE. She saw and heard two children running around playing, but it was late at night, and we weren't allowed to have inside visits. It turns out everybody at work says if someone sees the two children, then that means someone is going to die. And it's true. We have a chapel in the nursing home for the residents, but it is behind two sets of double doors, and the residents can't get in there on their own due to codes and locks, there is a set of stairs behind the first set of doors, and everybody has repeatedly seen a bald guy sitting in the chapel late at night through the window of the hall looking into the chapel. We had a resident who used to be a child molester. One night, he woke up in hysteria and crying, absolutely unconsolable. He said there were children surrounding him, standing by his bed and laughing at him. He died the next day. I went into a resident's room late one night during the rounds at around 3 a.m. I was working on the dementia slash wander risk unit. I'm standing next to the resident's bed, and she asks, who is that man standing behind the curtain? I didn't think much of it because she usually hallucinates, but within an hour, two residents from different units passed away, and the resident I was with fell out of bed and got really hurt. Lights turn on and off by themselves constantly late at night when everyone is in bed. I used to do trauma scene work back in the late 1990s and early 2000s. We would respond to murder scenes, suicides, unattended deaths, fire-related deaths, explosions, and any manner in which someone can die or be killed that would damage property. One night, as we worked 24-7 on call, I got a job where a house fire happened earlier in the day and killed multiple people on site. We usually got the call when the fire department or another agency released the property, and they would normally call a company like ours to secure the property. I used to like fires because there was less to clean up, as bodies usually die from smoke and not fire, so there was no bio cleanup. However, we were always required to board up any opening to preserve the scene and to avoid theft or injury from curious teens or thieves. We arrive on scene shortly after midnight. There was one sheriff's car ready to release the scene to us. I exchange paperwork, and my co-worker and I get started. Since I knew this was going to be a short, easy job, I just boarded up the doors and windows. There were only two of us needed. The house was a nice two-story home in a somewhat upscale neighborhood with a long driveway that had a turn towards the house. So we backed up our truck to the house. Usually, there are still bystanders outside when we pull up to a scene, but in this case, the entire block was dark, and no one that we saw was outside looking. When you go on scene at a fire, the inside is still very hot and humid, with an acrid smoke smell. We usually wear our protective clothing, so immediately the cool, crisp night went to a hot, humid sweat. Also, typically, there is no power, so we are using battery-powered lanterns and flashlights. We got started out to the rear of the house, which was the kitchen and family room area. We boarded up the broken windows, as usually the fire department breaks open vents when they put out a house fire and also usually cuts a hole in the roof to vent. If it were like that, we wouldn't bother boarding that up since it wouldn't be easy for a thief to climb up on and would be more dangerous for us to attempt to cover in the night. We knew from the stuff left behind by the fire department that whoever died in the fire must have died upstairs and probably couldn't make it out before smoke overtook them. As we were boarding up windows and sliding doors downstairs, we started to see shadows behind us. At first, you know your mind plays tricks on you, but we were both seeing the shadows at the same time. So we were like, let's hurry up and get out of here. The place was giving up the creeps, and mind you, we were in the business of seeing the worst situations. We suddenly stopped as we heard noises from upstairs. It sounded like someone was moving something heavy across the floor. Now it wouldn't be the first time we'd have to chase someone out of a property, but since we are responsible for anyone being inside, we yelled out that they better leave. 
We would carry hammer hatchets, so we grabbed them and went to the bottom of the stairs, where we heard what sounded like heavy footsteps. We both went upstairs, holding a hatchet in one hand and a flashlight in the other. We went from room to room, searching for the intruder. We didn't find anyone, now it's normal for a house to make a lot of noises after a fire or explosion. So we head back downstairs and start to finish off the board, working towards the living room and den area. Again, we heard a loud thud. Like something fell, and then we heard footsteps running. I look over at my partner, we are both looking like we just saw a ghost. My partner was a former football player, so I always felt good with him as my partner because I knew he'd have my back and he knew the same about me, but for that instance, we were both like two little girls. I think we even grabbed each other, he starts to yell out upstairs something like we're going to kick your ass and starts cussing. I told him, come on, let's go back upstairs. It's probably some teen ducker trying to scare us. I also told him, don't hurt them, but let's just get them out of here. Again, we went upstairs room to room, searched in the closets, showers, and behind the doors, but nothing, and we couldn't see anything heavy that fell over. We make it downstairs, and we say, let's just hurry up, finish up, and get the F out of here. Our last thing to do was secure the front door. If it couldn't be properly locked and closed, we would either use 2x4s or, in this case, screw on a hasp with a lock. We shut the front door and quickly screwed in the hasp, and as soon as we locked it, we heard bang 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 from the other side of the door, like if someone were banging on the door, we even felt it too, so it wasn't our imagination, as my partner was leaning on the door holding the flashlight as I was locking the hasp. I jumped out of the door and stood there. I turned to the darkness because my partner was already running down the driveway, and I jumped in the truck. He turned it and gunned it down the driveway. I had to run and try to jump in. He didn't really stop, he just slowed down enough for me to get in, and we were both screaming inside the cab, and I said to him, hey, the back of the truck is still open. He said, duck that I am not stopping. It was until about a few miles down that I got him to stop so I could close up the back of the truck. When we finally got back and went home, I couldn't sleep at all that night and had almost every light on in my apartment. I used to work at a small utility in Texas back in the day. The building I worked in was very small and only had five people in it during the day, one at night and on weekends. The building was located in a rough area with lots of transmission lines, commercial buildings, and retired generators. Crackheads and hookers were a very common sight. I always heard noises at night. I'm not the type to jump to the conclusion that noises are ghosts. I'd always assume it was an animal or a crackhead. However, I always felt like I was being watched while in the building. It was an uneasy feeling that caused me to turn around regularly to make sure no one was behind me. One night, I was walking down the hallway from the men's room back to the control room. I was walking by an office prior to my turn into the control room when I saw someone sitting at the desk in the office across the hall. I stopped, turned, and went into the office, and no one was there. This started to happen regularly. My coworker was once walking down that same hall when he knew no one was in the office during the day. He said he saw someone turn into the control room, thinking it was our boss, who followed to talk to him. There was no one there. I've never had those feelings of being watched again, and once I left the building, those feelings went away. It was a very weird place to work at night alone. This happened to me in November of last year. At the time, I worked a graveyard shift at a truck stop in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't the most exciting job in the world, but at least it allowed for my nocturnal sleep schedule, which was nice. Still, I've always been a bit of a procrastinator. Each night I would leave for work at 11.30 p.m., floor it down dark country roads, and be a little bit late. This irritated co-workers from the previous shift since they had to wait for me to get there. So, on this particular night, when I woke up and looked at the clock on my phone, I freaked the duck out. OSHT, I thought, I'm going to be so fired this time. It was around 11.40 p.m., and I was still in bed. I threw on my clothes, ran outside, and hopped in the car as fast as I could. My eyes were glued to the dashboard clock for almost the entire drive. 11.45 p.m., 11.50 p.m., 11.55 p.m. I pulled into work at the last minute, ran inside, and clocked in. It was 8 p.m. Jessica, a co-worker from the shift before me, asked me why I was four hours early. Confused and disoriented, I popped a seat on the counter, next to the cash register, as I tried to figure out what the duck was going on. After a while, she convinced me that it wasn't midnight after all and wanted to know if I was on drugs. I wasn't. I guess I hallucinated the whole time, even when I looked at different clocks and watched each minute pass, one after another, on the drive. It was hard to believe. 
I used to work at a hotel as the third shift desk clerk five nights a week. It was an easy job, and I was able to watch HBO and play on the internet while getting paid. My only real job was to rent out the rooms to late night travelers through the night shift window. Occasionally, the rooms would not be up to par for the customers, either because the maid staff failed to clean something or because the customer simply thought the room was not as nice as what they paid for. In such cases, I would offer another available room, give them a refund, and mark the room on our chart as dirty. One morning I had been home off my shift for maybe three hours getting my sleep in, and my boss called me, asking me to come in as there was an issue from the night before. I quickly got dressed and called a friend, as I didn't have a car of my own at the time. I got there maybe an hour after he called and found a very angry owner waiting for me in his office. He brought up the chart from the night before and asked about a room I had marked as dirty. He said he went to the room to check it personally that morning, as he made sure it had been marked dirty the day before as well, a night I did not work. He knew it had been cleaned and was upset to find it in shambles. Blankets, sheets, towels, and pillows were thrown about the room. He reviewed the tape the whole hour he waited for me to come in. Now we have two cameras facing the front desk. One aimed from the lobby, showing the wild desk and night window, and another overhead, getting a better view of the till and computer. On top of that, there is a camera outside facing the night window and two cameras in the hall leading to that room. I give you all that information to tell you the same thing I told my boss that day. That night, I remember having a couple, a man in his mid-thirties with dark hair and a black or dark blue denim jacket, and a blonde woman standing about five feet behind him in a red dress and white coat. The man came to the night window like any other person. He asked for a room with no preference for beds or smoking availability. I gave him the small paper to fill out his personal information, and he handed me the cash for the room. After putting the cash in the till, I activated his key cards and got his receipt. The man handed me the paper, and I handed him the cards and receipt. He nodded to me once and headed off. I didn't see him again that night, but this was the room that was now marked as dirty. The boss had the board where I would have clipped the customer's paper, but it was not there. The till was accurate for the number of rooms rented on my shift, not including the dirty one, and at the time I remembered renting the room, the cameras told a different story. You could see on the desk cameras as I get up from the computer, walk over to the window, stand there for a bit, walk back over to the till and card machine, then back to the window before returning to the computer and putting a sheet on the board to my left. However, on the camera facing the window outside at that exact same time, there was nothing. No man, no woman, not even a distortion. On the cameras in the hall, you never see anyone go near that room from the time it was cleaned the day before to the moment my boss entered it to check why it would be dirty. We were both stumped and sat there together for probably another two hours, going over the footage to figure out anything that could equal logic, but in the end, we both agreed it was just a very strange situation. If you have an explanation that makes sense, please feel free to let me know. In Fiji, we have this type of shapeshifter spirit that my mother told me takes the form of people who are being dishonest or just otherwise hiding something. There are normally telltale signs to know that they are shapeshifters, such as odd behavior and wearing clothes they usually would never wear. There have been two incidents where my own family has experienced it. I will start with my brother. My brother at the time was in his late teen or early adult years, so keep in mind that he was at home with us. This was around the early hours of the morning, 1 to 3 a.m., he had already worked his shift in the daytime. So, imagine the surprise to the security guard that was on night shift at the time when he saw my brother standing at the gate, asking to be let in. The security guard said he had a gut feeling that something was seriously off, but he interacted politely nonetheless, pointing out that he thought my brother had already worked his shift. The spirit was persistent, so the guy said he'd go and check the work log. Naturally, he was right, but when he looked back, there was nobody there. The other time, it happened to my cousin. I was told that this had happened twice in regards to it taking her form, and both times, my aunt and uncle let it in. The one I have a clear memory of was when she had classes, and so she got ready for school and left home. Her parents were going about their morning normally when, not that long afterward, they got a knock at the door. They open it, and there, supposedly, is my cousin. Only she's dressed in a Sulu chamba, Fijian traditional wear. They're concerned, and it's weird, but my aunt and uncle brush it off and let her in finding it odd that she's uncharacteristically quiet. That's when they say that my cousin ends up eating whatever she can get her hands on in the kitchen, just eating ravenously, then she heads to her room to sleep. She sleeps until the afternoon, waking up and just leaving without a word. A few minutes or so afterward, my actual cousin comes bouncing in home, waving her friends by and chattering about her day. Understandably, my aunt and uncle were freaked, that, and she really had been gone the whole day, 
as her friends and the school pretty much confirmed her attendance in the log. There are a lot more cases I've found people from my country talking about online, it seems more common than I thought. A parent arriving home and acting the same way, eating everything they can find before leaving, only for their actual parent's car to roll into the driveway moments later, that kind of thing. When I was a sophomore in college, I got a night shift job at a furniture factory. It was easy work and relatively laid back due to only four guys working that shift. My job was to document and load the furniture after it was done. It was close to the end of my shift. Close to 5.30 am I had to use the bathroom. The way the plant is set up, the bathroom is about a three minute walk away. You have to walk outside and into another part of the plant just to get to the bathroom. When I got to the other part of the plant, I saw a tall and skinny man with dark, long hair. He was wearing a striped green shirt. The thing was, he was ridiculously tall. Like 7 feet tall. I saw him enter the bathroom when I was about 50 feet away. When I enter the bathroom, it's quiet. This bathroom had one urinal and one stall. I realized how quiet it was, so I looked under the stall to see if I could see his feet. I didn't see anything, so I asked if he was okay. No response. I opened the door, and it was empty. I thought it was weird until it dawned on me that this man had disappeared. There's no way he could have gone in the 15 seconds it took me to reach the door and get inside the bathroom. I did my business and sprinted back to my department. I told my lead at the time what I saw, and he shrugged off, saying I was tired and needed sleep. I thought maybe it was a new security hire because I've never seen him before. I thought and thought about it, and at some point I thought it was a time traveler, but nah. I asked around to see if I saw a ghost or something, but nothing. Nobody saw what I saw. I saw this man for a good 10 seconds before he disappeared. I just don't know what it truly was. I still get chills from it. I used to work a graveyard shift as security for a large animal park. The back gate was down a long, winding road and was to be used for employee entrance and deliveries. Beyond this, the road ended, and it was all private property of the park, so most of the time, there was really nothing going on around for miles aside from the animals that were nocturnal and making their usual sounds. Once the park guests had left for the day, only a few remained in the evening hours, and most were security or keepers that were required for some round-the-clock care. Even on the road itself, I had a nice view, you could see headlights approaching a long way off, so nothing could really sneak up on you. Since the side road didn't have lights, it was quite easy to notice when an approaching vehicle was heading down the side road. So yeah, most hours were spent in the dark alone in a shack, letting a few people in and out for the night. But the eeriest thing was that some nights I could hear flutes playing on the hill just beside the gate. At first, I didn't think much. There are a lot of locals that belong to native tribes, and we are actually quite close to some reservations, at least on the map. I assumed it was maybe a camp nearby or something going on at the park, some kind of night outing. Then one day I mentioned it to another security guard, and he said, kind of smiling, oh, you heard the ghost flute, I laughed and thought he was being funny. But he went on and said he had worked there for about 10 years and could never figure out where it was coming from. And that often, as he made his rounds in the vast expanse of the grounds, he could hear the flutes playing as if they maintained the exact same distance all the time. And the grounds are huge, this is no small park. I heard it many times during my shifts there and just tried to ignore it. I'm always one for logical explanations first. Then one night, they asked me if I could cover the security shift at the newly built animal hospital that was down the road from the park. Security was at an all-time high because protesters were upset about the park, which had saved some elephants that were soon to arrive. So that night, I took one of the security carts and headed through the park to get to the hospital. It would take about 12 minutes by cart to get there, so you can understand the distance. As I left the security shack, I heard the light notes of the flute coming from the small hill, as usual. Soon, I was driving through the dark. I paused at one point to chat with another employee about the night's duties and continued. I was never afraid of the dark there. Somehow, with all the animals awake and making noise, you don't feel alone. I had just parked the cart outside the hospital and was grabbing my gear when I heard it right behind me. The flutes. I'm not joking when I feel the cold wash over me. I whipped around, but just the dark ground lay beyond. It sounded like the flute was maybe 25 yards away at most. I couldn't get into the building fast enough. I called to talk to someone who was feeling foolish. I finally called the back gate, and the guy who was covering my shift said, yeah, I heard the notes, too. Just now. Yet he described them as right there at the back gate, as usual. It was one of the longest shifts of my life. The hospital was almost completely empty except for one vet, who would disappear into another part from time to time. 6 AM, 
Shift ending. I was so happy to see the sun starting to put a little glow on the horizon. I had to drive the cart all the way back to the back gate, and I was gripping like a mad person the whole time. Soon after, I ended up getting off the night shift and into regular day hours, and I didn't hear the flutes after that. This happened about three years ago. I worked as a correctional officer for about five years in an old county jail. One night, while I was doing my rounds, I entered our high security unit. This unit was mostly for unruly or dangerous inmates who often liked to fight others or who had high notoriety cases such as murders. It was about 11 o'clock at night, and the lights were about to go off for the night. In this particular unit, a lot of the inmates would stand at their doors and watch the daytime TV from their cell since it was a solitary housing unit. I finished my rounds down the stairs, and I began climbing to the top tier. I glanced up at the nearby cell and saw an inmate watching TV from his door. I looked away for a moment and looked back, and he was gone. I walked up to the cell and looked in. The cell was completely vacant. My stomach dropped. I had heard from my co-workers and inmates often that the jail was definitely haunted, but this was my first personal experience with anything of that nature. I finished up my rounds and returned to my sergeant's office, where I told him about what I had experienced. Very calmly, he asked which cell it was. I told him number 7. He told me that about 15 years prior, an inmate had killed themselves in that exact cell after he was charged with the murder of his child. My SG was a young officer at the time and was first on the scene. He told me that he truly believed that the inmate was framed for the murder and that the mother was the truly guilty one. The story gave me chills. I worked a graveyard shift in a prison that was built in 1910. I saw many spooky things, chairs moving, doors slamming in admin areas when admin staff was long gone, and of course the occasional self-doubt of is someone sitting or moving over there? When all inmates are locked in cells and sleeping. Nothing really surprised or shocked me, it was a 100-year-old prison that used to do regular executions, had its fair share of riots, and had loads of violence. It used to be a maximum security prison until the late 1990s. So, of course, some unexplainable things are going to happen, there's tons of negative energy within those walls. So, like I said, I wasn't really entirely spooked, just a little startled by it all, until one night. I was on A unit, which went up four stories high of cells and 45 cells long. Each floor was called a tier, and I was the only officer on that unit at the time. It was maybe 2 a.m., there was a B unit officer and a rover that went back and forth between A and B to help us out. The rover was on B unit at the time. So here I am, doing my hourly tier checks to make sure everyone is breathing and no one is tattooing or sneaking a cigarette, as often happens on graveyards. I'm on tier 2, halfway through, and I hear boot steps behind me. I turn, expecting to see the rover catching up to me, however, I see nothing, and the steps stop. So I keep going along, doing my checks, and I hear them again, 5 to 10 feet behind me, going at my pace. I turn and see nothing. I shrug it off as a possible echo of my boots. I continue my checks. On tier 3 now, boots are still standing strong behind me. As a history buff, I know that rubber-soled shoes weren't invented until around the 1890s and are still not commonly used, especially in professional dress shoes, until well into the 1960s and 1970s. This step was a loud, heavy clack of a heel, not like high heels, more like leather-soled dress shoes. Officers in the 20s and 30s didn't have rubber-soled tactical boots, they typically wore hardened leather-soled shoes, and this is what is crossing my mind as I continue my checks. None of the officers on shift had loud boots on, we wore sound-dampening tactical boots. So when I made this realization, I stopped entirely and just listened. Click clack, click clack just a couple more times. Maybe 5 seconds of silence goes by. Then click clack, click clack, click clack it gets fast and louder as if it's running towards me now click clack, click clack then boom, it stops almost seemingly right in front of me. I don't move a muscle, as I am hearing this plain as day and yet seeing nothing. Then I hear a voice, weak and quiet, like a whisper, but with a tone of anger. It said, why are you out? as if I were an inmate, and I wasn't supposed to be out of my cell. Still, nothing and no one is around me, except for sleeping inmates in their cells. So I noped my ass right back to the officer desk and stayed there for the duration of the shift, just trying to make sense of it. The rover did my checks and counts for me for the next couple hours. Great fella. I guess I'm not the only one who has come across Officer Boots, as he was so affectionately named. He has made his presence known to many people, officers, and inmates alike. I've also heard many other stories and tales from around the facility, but that was just my spookiest personal experience. I worked a graveyard shift in a psychiatric crisis facility for a while. We'd had a few deaths on the premises over the years. 
we had some people come in and fatally odd in the lobby, a couple people died of medical conditions in their sleep in our rooms. We were also in a terrible neighborhood, and we had a few past instances of people being shot and killed in our parking lot. And on one occasion, one of my co-workers died of a heart attack during our shift. The building is old and creepy, even without that history. I hated using the upstairs bathroom, but sometimes I had no choice. I'd sometimes see a shadow darting around corners or moving at the end of the hall. The weirdest was in the bathroom, though. Several times, I'd be in there staring at my phone and avoiding work, and I'd hear the door open and the water turn on at the faucet. There would be zero footsteps heard, which was weird because sounds traveled in this bathroom. It was very small, with only two stalls, so you'd hear everything the other person was doing in there. When this would happen, there were no footsteps, no shuffling of clothing, no breathing, just dead silence. Sometimes the water would turn off and the paper towel dispenser would go off, but never once would the door open again, and the door was so loud that you couldn't miss it. The paper towel was always untouched, and usually the water was left on. The faucet was old-fashioned, you had to turn a knob to turn it on. The same was true of the paper towel dispenser. I found out from other co-workers that this is a common occurrence up there. It was never malicious, it was like somebody going about their business and not realizing they were dead. I'm a custodian for a school district. I'm going on three years, and every school has been haunted. The first time was at a high school. As a custodian, your duty is to first and foremost secure the site. I wanted to emphasize it because it's important in the story. Every new custodian develops an OCD, so to speak, checking their doors, due to the fact that you can lose your job before you pass probation. It was a long weekend, and I was still a newbie. Everything was closed on my assignment except this window on the second floor. I was responsible for the top. It was night, BTW, I couldn't find it, and it turned out to be a back room and a classroom window. I would always check my doors, one of the doors was left open perfectly. Perfectly straight, humans just swing and throw stuff around. No one was around me. I know I didn't leave doors open, especially because my job depends on it. We'll let that go. I was at an elementary school, working in the office with my earphones on. I'm the only person on the site. I'm cleaning a restroom, have music on, and hear a thud at the other end of the office. Take off my earphones and go investigate, nothing fell, nothing dropped. I was the only person on campus. The second story of said elementary, after you dump trash in rolling trash cans, you just toss them, no one cares about them. No one strategically puts trash cans anywhere, they're trash cans. I dumped the trash and threw all the trash cans in the hallway. I went into a room. I swear on me. The trash cans were lined up parallel in a perfect line, the exact distance away from each other I noticed, and I got freaked out. No one was there, I would never put trash cans that perfectly. It was so weird. Not too long after, I'm studying on that same second floor at lunch for classes I'm taking. I hear a doorknob rattle in the next room. I thought a supervisor was going to check on me, they do that randomly once a month, but no one was in the hallway. What's unsettling is that I'm sure I was the only person on campus. I secure the site every time. Last experience, most recent. I was talking at a friend's house as we were having a conversation. His doorknob rattles. We look at the doorknob, look back at each other, and just continue the conversation and laugh. I can't make this up. I put everything I said on me. Schools are haunted. I had just started my first job as a nurse tech, CNA, at a local nursing home. My mother had worked at the place about 20 years prior, up until the point where the state board shut it down due to the poor living conditions and care for the residents living there. After sitting empty for 15 years, a new owner came in and bought the place, and I was one of four total night shift staff, two per night, 12-hour shifts. At the time, we had around 70 rooms, fully renovated and furnished, but 68 of those rooms were empty, with only two rooms having one resident each. The building had one long hall that was split into two plus, plus, signs for the ward. In the middle of the intersection, there was a nurse station on each end. All the unused rooms remained empty, with doors closed and the halls to those rooms closed and locked, to keep furniture and supplies from being shifted to other areas. Only the nurse had a key to those halls, and it remained locked in the medroom. With only two patients, me and the nurse would often be sitting at the desk just chatting or playing on our phones most of the night. Thank goodness for my sanity, because otherwise I would have convinced myself I was crazy. There were so many times we would hear noises, banging, doors slamming, and even screaming coming from these closed-off halls that we would actually call the police to come and search the locked corridors for intruders. I will exclude specifics because it would be way too many. In the first experience we had, 
there was one short hall to our right that housed the dining area and one patient room only. It was our quarantine room for anyone who had something we deemed could put the rest of the patients at risk. It had never been used by patients or staff since then. Things began with the call light in that room going off by itself randomly. Some nights, it would go off two to three times over the course of 12 hours. Of course, we laughed and chalked it up to just faulty wiring or equipment. So we actually unplugged and removed the call light from the room. It seemed to fix the issue for a couple weeks. Then one night, the call light in that room began ringing with no call button plugged in. We go in together to find the shower in the bathroom turned on by itself. These things continued in this room throughout my year at this facility. After speaking with my mother, she recalled this room from her time there as housing a patient that was essentially brain dead and said she was convinced the man wasn't because the same things would occur then as well. The second major thing that occurred was that one of our patients was a woman in her 50s who had severe mental deficits but was physically able. Her room was the first, closest to the station. It was always the same, at least once a week, during nightly rounds, she would always go missing down the long corridor, and we would always find her in the same room, about 20 rooms down toward the next nurse's station. The TV would always be on in the room, and she would be in that bathroom, putting on makeup, saying she was getting ready for her date with the man in that room, one time sleeping in the bed. There was no man. Things got worse. About six months go by of this, and when one night we hear a scream, we go in. She has fallen and hit her head on the table, and he is going on about how he pushed her. She goes off to the hospital, needs brain surgery to stop bleeding, and comes back unable to get herself out of bed. She could no longer get herself to that room at night, but every single night when I got to work, I would turn that TV off at the start of my shift, and sometime in the middle of the night, it would be back on. Third, near the end of my time at this facility, I was caring for a woman who was completely blind. Her neighbor was brought in earlier that week on palliative care and was unable to wake. He had passed just before I arrived for the evening, and the funeral home could not retrieve him until the next day. At some point late in the night, when doing my rounds, this woman insisted she saw a man standing in the corner of her room watching her. I convinced her that it must have been a dream. Just before leaving in the morning, I was getting her ready for breakfast, and she again insisted that she saw him again, and she knew it wasn't a dream, and described this man. The description matched exactly to a picture his family was showing me from when he was 20 to 30 years younger a couple days prior. I once worked at a gas station in my town. It was nothing like what you see today, where they have entire delis, row after row of snacks, or anything like that. This place was old as dirt, and if we had five customers inside at once, it was packed wall to wall. I always had to work the overnight shift there, which meant watching whatever channels the antenna could pick up late at night on our tiny box TV in the corner and smoking cigarettes behind the counter, yeah, we could actually do that back then. My boss had an ancient desktop computer set up in the back room for our truck rental business that we ran off of, and I liked to sneak back there and check my MySpace and a few other sites. I could always hear the bell when a customer came in, and I had a direct line of sight to the front of the store from the desk, so it wasn't an issue. I was even allowed to take my dog with me once in a while, a little corgi. I would often hear noises in the back, but I always chalked it up to my imagination because it was late at night and I was sure that I was overtired. Well, that changed when I began to bring my dog with me. I would bring him right in the back while I surfed the web, and he would always lay down facing away from me. It didn't take him more than a few minutes each night to begin perking his ears up and ruffling under his breath long before I began to hear anything. Once they were noises I could make out, he would be standing at attention by that point, gazing fixedly into what seemed to be thin air. The problem with taking my dog with me was that I would have to walk him, and since I didn't feel comfortable going out of the store that late at night, I only took him a few times. One of the many times he wasn't with me, I was sitting on the computer, and I heard the bell on the front door jingle. When I looked up, I saw what looked like a guy walk in, and I immediately got up to go help him. I stepped into the booth and saw that he was over in the corner, at the very end of my counter. My view was obstructed by the small TV in the corner and a rather large scratch-off ticket display, so while I could see the arm and shoulder of his black jacket, I couldn't see anything more than that. I broke out into my friendly smile and said, Hello. Can I help you find anything? This was in part because I'm a genuinely friendly person and in part because many of our customers tried to steal the Slim Jims and 5-hour energy bottles that were kept over there. I had been asking the owner for months to move him, but he never bothered with it. As soon as I got done speaking, the man turned to me, and my heart dropped. On his right temple, the one that was furthest away from me, was a bullet hole with blood coming out of it, running down his face in a thick, almost black line. I remember gripping the counter and my eyes filling with horror because there was no way this man should have still been standing with something like that going on. 
I remember his eyes were just filled with sadness and exhaustion. As I was stuttering and reaching for the phone to call 911, he just left. He literally disappeared in front of me. One minute he was there, and the next he was gone. I tried for the longest time to tell myself that I must have fallen asleep somehow and dreamed it, or that it was just an imagination from my overly tired mind, but I could not do it. I know what I saw, and it was all in perfect clarity. After a few weeks, I eventually mentioned it vaguely to my coworker, who relieved me each morning. I didn't want to sound insane, so I just asked if she had noticed anything strange in the store. That's when she blurted out that calling cards and gift cards often drop randomly from the display over in that corner, and she hears what sounds like someone walking around when no one is in the store. I finally broke down and told her what I saw, and she laughed and said, it makes sense, and then went on to tell me about a murder that had happened a few decades prior. Apparently, a man pulled up to get gas, and another man saw him from the street and thought he was someone who owed him money. He peeled into the parking lot and shot him point blank before he could even make it inside to get his gas, and then sped away. He was caught and convicted, but she couldn't remember any names, and she thought the gentleman I saw was the spirit of the one who got shot. That place is still standing today, and it still creeps me out. Just to add, I also used to hear a group of girls laughing hysterically outside, but no one was ever there, even when I was brave enough to go out and look. Who knows what that was about. Anyway, 